All right, let's continue. And um, during this lecture, we'll turn um, 90 degrees, uh, actually quite literally, uh, to what George was talking about. And uh, Ian Stewart is going to tell us about the transverse motion of uh, particles in the nucleon. So uh, he'll tell us about the three dimensional structure of the nucleon at the electron ion collider. His lectures will be uh, the blackboard. You can see also the material for the lectures is posted uh, on the Indico site, including his uh, uh, written notes and some information for the lectures that you might need. Might find this. All right, thanks. So I'm going to give all my lectures to the Blackboard. I'm going to use the whole board. So you're sitting such that you can't see the board, you can adjust yourself now. So I've been asked to talk about the 3D structure at the EIC, the 3D structure of the nuclear. And in particular, what I want to focus on are what are called transverse momentum distribution. So 3D structure is actually broader than just transverse distributions. And I've decided to try to let it to have things fit into uh, three lectures. So we will focus only on these. So transverse momentum is dependent part on distribution momentums. And that's a lot to write. I wrote it once. We're going to abbreviate it. And I want to say this all. Right, TMD for transverse momentum independent. When I want to say transverse momentum dependent part on distributions, I'll add an S, TMDs. So these come in, in various flavors. The simplest example is taking a part on distribution function that George was talking about in his lectures this morning and adding to that not only a, momentum, a measurement of longitudinal momentum, which is this variable X in a part on distribution function, but also transverse momentum. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. For technical reasons, we have a camera that follows the speaker and yeah. it will follow you. It's first, it needs to understand that you are the speaker. Uh -huh. You can come here such that it, oh, it knows where you are and then it'll follow you from here. So, All right, I mean, okay, okay. so here you go. So now, now for you folks, don't move because great. every time you move, this will try. Okay, so it will follow him, you see. Can you go? Yes, yes, yes. You're still the speaker. Oh, not anymore. He's not. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll switch it to a different camera, but I'll first find out. So I posted some references for this material. One of them is uh, something we're quite proud of. We've written it recently, a handbook on transverse momentum and in physics. So the archive number is 2304-3302. There's also, if you're interested in Kind of the effective field theory aspects of this story. Then there's a course that I have. It's an online course that's <laughs> on the Indigo side. And that goes beyond what I'll talk about in these lectures. This is sort of the material for the lectures, a particular chapter two of this book. You won't cover much. Chapter two itself is like 90 pages. You won't cover more than such things for chapter two. There's lots of good stuff in there. Uh, and if you want to go sort of even further beyond the book, the handbook, there's also stuff about effective field theory. So before I get going, let me try to motivate TMDs. Let's have a oh, so why are these things interesting? So we're really exploring the, some the complicated system that we've been exploring for like 30 or 40 years, namely the proton. It's a relativistic bound state. 
a bag, if you like, of quarks and gluons moving at the speed of light confined into this complicated object. Quantum fluctuations, relativity being important. And this is the object that is a kind of a fundamental serious thing that we've been studying for, for a long time. And transverse momentum dependence provides another handle to understanding those complicated bound states. So, floor, histories of the proton. And when we're doing that, we're looking inside the proton, we're taking snapshots, we're using some hard probe to probe short distances to see the partons, the quarks and the gluons that are inside the proton. And you can think of this, if this is your proton, circular approximation that George introduced. And if the proton is moving in this direction, and then you find a parton in the proton, say here, the longitudinal momentum of that parton is some fraction, say x, of the proton momentum. That's in the direction of the motion of the proton. And transverse just means in the plane that's transverse to this vector, transverse momentum would be this. And so we want to make now not only probe the x longitudinal fraction of the moment of that parton, but also the kt transverse. And of course, this is complicated. There's all sorts of things, and that's what makes this particular study interesting. There's gluons in there, and not just quarks. Now, in order to do that at the EIC, we're going to exploit spin information. And so this proton could have some polarization vector, spin polarization, or on. And also by being very differential about how we make the measurements, and including all the angles, we can probe different aspects of this quark polarization. Okay, so there's going to be spin aspects to these measurements, but which by lecture three, I'll fully introduce you to. We'll start out with how we find that spin, we'll get to spin later. And these are very interesting because they provide yet another handle on the structure of the proton. Uh, and in particular, if you think about quantum mechanics and you think of like, like hyperfine splitting, uh, you know, there's, there's the Bohr model where you have your, your levels for hydrogen, but then you have fine structure and the fine structure can be spin dependent. And we get a more deep picture of what's going on inside, the, inside hydrogen by studying the spin dependent structure. The same is true for a proton by studying the spin dependent structure and in particular spin momentum correlations, which you have more of, you have transverse momentum, we can get a deeper understanding inside the proton. Right back. And we'll get into, into detail later, but just for this for the moment, let me give you two examples. There's something called a worm gear, TMD, that involves the transverse momentum dotted into a spin vector. And then times one of these transverse momentum distribution functions depends on so this pre-factor for that distribution is, is exactly a dot product between transverse momentum and a spin vector, and it wouldn't be there if you weren't measuring the transverse. Another one that's more famous is what's called the Simmons function. It involves also a dot product, <laughs> just with the epsilon tensor, so it's an anti-symmetric dot product, metric dot product. Okay, so these are kind of things that you can get additional access to by studying transverse. So that's one motivation. And it's a pretty big motivation. I see really study this with these details inside the proton. Uh, yeah. 
Petrus, uh, you say F, uh, this is upper, is, uh, is stronger, yeah. but what is not down? Uh, this is just for, for the time being, this, this notation is just some symbol that's defined by these names, but like defined by looking at the terms that have this structure in front. And, you know, I could have called them A, B, C, okay. or no indices, but okay. Okay. for now, it's just okay. we'll okay. talk a little bit more why it gets this particular subscripts and superscripts okay. later on. Okay, okay. So. There's another motivation actually that is worth mentioning. And that is that precision physics actually depends on really understanding these transverse momentum distributions. And I'll give you, it's not really the focus of my lectures, but I'll give you two examples. One is Higgs physics. It turns out when you're producing a Higgs boson, the most thing you're interested in is what is it decay to, how is it produced, what are the channels. But in order to get there, it's important to measure some differential distributions of the Higgs boson. Don't just measure the total rates, but you also want to have a handle on the kinematics of the Higgs boson. And the most important Higgs momentum distribution is its transverse momentum distribution. Experimentally, it's used to uh, really understand what's going on. And so people want to make precision predictions and compare them to experiment and also use it in the experiment in Monte Carlo to calibrate things. Another example is what's called Drell Yan. And I will be talking about this one today. So Delian is at the LHC is proton proton, goes to a B plus B minus pair. And then as George was talking about, it's an inclusive process, inclusive process like, like DIS that he was talking about where you have anything else, where X is anything. And in this process, again, you can measure the transverse momentum dependence. Here it's the transverse momentum dependence of this left B plus B minus pair. You would measure. And that measure, those measurements are some of the most precise measurements that we've actually made of a distribution, of a hadronic distribution, the sub percent level, 0.2 percent uncertainty. Okay, it's very precise. Theoretically, we have to sort of play catch up, experiment as they had. And so finally, just coming kind of back. Closing the circle. The motivation for why we want to study these distributions is really to get at some of the properties of QCD that are, that are kind of mysterious. So there's confinement, the fact that these quarks and gluons that are moving at the speed of light are confined inside a hadron, and something called hadronization, which is a related phenomena, where if I produce in a hard collision, a quark, and it's traveling along for a little while as a free quark, then it, it starts splitting and it produces what's called a jet. And then the parktons inside that jet hadronize. You don't see free quarks, as we were discussing this morning. You see hadrons. And so they're going to find their friends and they're going to form a bound state. So that's the kind of the inverse process of the initial state. Where you're probe, having a proton, it's already existing, and you're smashing them together, probing inside the proton. Patternization is in some hard collision, you produce a hard <laughs> very energetic one, and it finds some friends and becomes a hadron. Okay, so both of these phenomena are related to <laughs> novel and interesting aspects of QCD that we can study for decades. And EIC is really going to shed light on these things through these measurements. EMDs because you're finding you're having another handle on how those mechanisms work. It's not just a one-dimensional distribution anymore, like partial distribution functions that are longitudinal. Now you've got a three-dimensional distribution. That's where the 3D title comes from. Yeah. Uh, what sense uh, will a uh, will it improve our understanding of the mechanism? Yeah, so it it's still just kind of giving you a snapshot, but you're asking now the question. What is the distribution in kind of transverse to the collision axis? But what do what the, the distribution of particles look like? So it's not related anymore to the boost that would like make you hit each other very energetically. You're getting kind of a more picture of, of like what if they look primarily inside the, the proton in this transverse direction? What's the intrinsic transverse momentum of a particle that's fluctuating around 
it's just another it is just another handle in the end yeah uh, is there a difference between the hydrogenization in ei i mean electron ion collisions and ion ion collisions there is uh of the hadronization in the hadronization we're thinking about like the production of pions and so for to first approximation probably in there can can be interactions with the medium and that's what can cause a difference um and it depends a little bit on the on the scales of the problems there could be some difference um yeah yeah I, you know the thing that we're going to observe in the end is is a pion. And the question is in the formation of that pion, did it get interact with the medium? Did the particles that are forming the bound state before they actually form the bound state, did they interact with the medium and that affect the hadronization? What the number of pions? Like, such as, yeah. I mean, you, you have to, like, yeah, you can get more pions, certainly, in an electron ion collider because you've got more particles to begin with, right? That's not, you have to sort of mod out by the number of. Nuclei, nucleons that you have inside your nuclei. Um, but even on top of that, there can be an effect that can affect the hadronization. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right. So, what are going to be some roles of the lecturers? <clears throat> well, the first role is going to be connect measurements, things that you like measure at the EIC or other are being measured already in other colliders, to these TMDs that I broadly introduced. And that's going to require some understanding of factorization, which is kind of a technical topic. And I'll try to walk you through a little bit of things related to factorization to give you a feel for what's going on and why we get these TMDs coming out of measurements that are related to transverse momentum. Now, an important concept in part on distribution functions is the fact that they're universal. That's what allows us to take them from one experiment or do global fits to them and use them in another experiment or do global fits for them. That really gives a, con a meaning to them beyond just the single uh, measurement that you're doing. It applies to multiple measurements of multiple different types of colliders. And the same thing is true here for transverse momentum dependent distributions. We have to ask about how universal they are. And it turns out that things are you know, more complicated once we have this additional measurement of transverse momentum. So it's a little less universal than part time distribution functions, but actually still understandable. And so I guess I could say there it's just as universal, but it's as part time distribution functions, but a little harder to understand. And that's because what are called Wilson lines that show up in the definition of these situations play a really fundamental role in understanding their universality. And so I'll introduce you to the idea of Wilson line eventually, maybe in lecture two, we'll talk about how they play a role in universality, what makes these universal functions that we can take from one measurement to another, take one experiment. Now, it turns out that when you're making predictions, you want to make uh, predictions um, for these transverse momentum distributions. And both perturbative QCD and non perturbative QCD play a role. So I'll, I'll have to explain why that is. And that you'll see that in my lectures, there's going to be various expansions happening and they're going to be related to how you separate perturbative and non perturbative effects. And we're going to want to obtain accurate high precision predictions compared to experiment, make sure we're understanding what we're doing. And that's going to involve summing log, large logarithms. So, in the title of the indigo, one of the words in the title says resonation, and that comes into making precision predictions. So I want to, when you hear some theorists talking about resummation, and they do some next to next leading log calculation, I'll try to give you a sense of exactly what they're talking about. Non-perturbative, you mean instant bonds? Non-perturbative here, I just mean physics at confinement scale. Yeah, so very general. Question? 
for universality, what do you mean universal with respect to the nucleus? Or for example, you, yeah, universal with respect to the nucleus, but like, for example, I'll, I'll in a second introduce two processes that the same distribution show up in Drelian, as well as in something like EIS. Other questions? I have one. Okay. Are you going to put your notes on? on, on I the have. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. So these notes are already posted. You want to follow along that way? <laughs> okay. So let me introduce two promises for you. That'll be allow me to be a little more explicit about what this is how it means. So I already introduced, I wrote this Gallian process, but now let me dig into it a little bit deep, get a little bit deeper. So we're going to study Gallian in the center of mass frame of the incoming protons. And in that frame, we have protons colliding like this, back to back. And we can take the transverse momentum of the proton, proton A, proton B, the transverse momentum of proton A is zero, the transverse momentum of proton B is zero. And they have big momenta just along with this z-axis. <clears throat> now, sometimes it's useful to draw that picture in a little bit different way. So let me draw it again. So here's proton A, here's proton B. And what we actually collide you collide these together are some QQ bar pair, and that QQ bar pair produces a virtual photon, and the virtual photon produces the U plus B minus pair. Okay, it's starting to look like a fine diagram now. <laughs> now, let's let the floor vector of this virtual photon be Q, which corresponds to the total floor vector for the U plus B minus pair. And in these types of divider uh, analyses, it's useful to use what are called light components. Let me introduce them. So I'll write a four vector decomposed into instead of zero, instead of energy Z and X and Y, I'll write it in terms of plus minus QT. QT is just QX and QY. That's just a shorthand for QX and QY. And Q plus and Q minus are just convenient linear combinations of Q0 and Q0. Like and the reason that we do this is because things tend to have either a large Q plus and a small Q minus, or a large Q minus and a small Q plus. Because if Q0 and Z are in the same direction, Z has a same sign as the energy, then these add and the Q plus will be big, but the, in the, the minus sign, they subtract and the, the Q minus will be small. Of course, if you flip the sign, it's going to be the opposite. So in this picture over here, we could say that PA plus is big and PB minus is big and the other components are small. And that means that the center of mass energy uh, it's basically, just giving like the product of PA plus minus center of mass energy of the collision is going to be divided as P and A plus P and B all squared. <clears throat> okay, so what do we measure? Well, in Drellian, we can differential in all of these things. They're usually organized in a different way. Talk about Q squared, which is This combination. <laughs> we talk about QT, and when I mean the magnitude of QT, I'll just drop the back of the top of it. That one stays the same. And then we talk usually about what is called rapidity, and that's the ratio of plus to minus. It's defined as the logarithm of the ratio of plus divided by minus. <laughs> rapidity is just a way of math, is another expression for kind of tracking the polar angle. Are your particles going this way or are they going to the beam? 
of the particles going transverse to the beam, then the rapidity is zero, and the z-axis is zero, and plus and minus are the same. It's transverse to the beam. So it's a variable that goes from minus infinity in one direction along the beam, zero when transverse to the beam, and plus infinity when going along the other axis along the beam. So just a mapping of theta, if you like. Okay, so how could I get transverse momentum into this picture? Well, I'm going to be a little bit schematic at this point to get more precise later on, but the way that transverse momentum can come in is as follows. We can imagine having transverse momentum distribution functions that are sensitive to these quarks here and their transverse momentum. So let me call this one I, quark I, one J. Now, at the, the vertex of the collision, the, the, if the quarks are carrying some transverse momentum, then that just gets annihilated. And so it goes into the transverse momentum function. So there's a delta function here. It says the transverse momentum of this quark, transverse momentum of this quark, which I used the sign convention where they're both coming in, is equal to the transverse momentum of Q. That's what this delta function is saying. Incoming quark, incoming anti-quark, total adds to QT. And then we can imagine that you know, if we pick a quark out of the proton, we don't know precisely you know, what its transverse momentum is, but there's some way of describing it in kind of probabilistic type sense. As some kind of distribution function, and that's what these TMDs are doing. This f, this f, are like generalizations of Hartman distribution function that are telling us about the transverse momentum of these particles inside of the proton. Yeah. We'll hold on to the PDFs, the longitudinal. Or orthogonal to the longitudinal coordinates. Longitudinal coordinates are still there. That's what I call x a and x b. So it's not strictly speaking a probability distribution as was mentioned this morning, but the way I like to think about it is it kind of just acts like one in the sense that it tells us, are there more particles with this transverse momentum or are there more particles with that transverse momentum, say plus one GV? So relatively speaking, we can more think of it as telling us, do we have more particles of this transverse momentum or that transverse momentum or this longitudinal fraction or that longitudinal fraction? Even if it's not well normalized. Okay. I will say more about this X variable. You'll hear more about it in Jordan's talk tomorrow and upcoming days. For now, let me just note this X. A variable is just actually related to the kinematics of the photon, and it can be written in terms of Q, this rapidity variable, given to S. So it's just fixed by things that you can measure in the final state uh, about the, the Q plus and minus pair. Okay. And more importantly for us is to ask how can this QT not, how can this QT be non zero? If you imagine that the, that the initial partons were colliding just like the protons, where they're just colliding along an axis, then they would have transverse momentum at zero too, right? If the protons were coming in like this, if this guy was also a head-on collision, there would be no transverse momentum. KT and KT prime would be zero, then QT would be zero too. So in order for QT to be not zero, you have to have some non-zero KT or some non-zero KT prime. And the way that that can happen is that these things are inside a bound state. Even if the total transverse momentum is zero, the particles inside the bound state are rattling around and they can have some intrinsic transverse momentum. And if they were intrinsic, 
whether it's prime or unprime, there's going to be momentum of order the confinement scale, which is called lambda TCD, of the proton. This is the, the scale usually defined when the strong point goes up, but it's the scale is a few hundred MeV that governs physics inside the proton. So that's one way for the QT to be not equal to zero. But there's another way, and that is that maybe before this quark annihilates, maybe it radiated a gluon final state. Then that gluon could carry away some transverse momentum, and this quark here would have to balance it. So gluon radiation can also uh, give, trans give transverse momentum. And the gluon radiation can give transverse momentum that's actually doesn't have to be constrained to just be the confinement scale. It could actually be much larger than the confinement scale. You have this extra gluon kind of from an extra jet in the final state, um, a larger transverse momentum. So there's both small transverse momentum, which may be the most interesting for some of the questions that we're trying to get at, but they're always going to be underneath this gluon radiation effect. We're going to have to disentangle those. Talk about how that happens. Okay. Yeah. If you needed to put that TMDs may depend on longitudinal impulse. Yeah. I so just to set a balance. I talked about the balance of transverse momentum here, but there's also a balance of the plus and the minus components of momentum. And that that that's what leads to these variables being here. But I haven't explained exactly why it's. That happens, and I'll go get into it a little more in a few minutes. Yeah. It seems like QT would ne almost never be zero according to these definitions. Is that true? Yeah, it's almost never zero. Okay. Now, there's several effects for why. They get to by the end. Yeah. So, uh, gluon radiation, isn't it already included in increasing KT, which is quarks are emitting gluons, and that's how it gets. Yeah, so I've defined intrinsic here to be something at the confinement scale. This object, I'm glad you asked the question, this object includes both. Okay, so it includes the intrinsic as well as the fact that the gluon may radiate in its fundamental definition, which we'll get to by the end of the next lecture, not today. But there's sort of two physical effects point. one at large transverse momentum from these gluons that radiate. And if it's a large transverse momentum, I can actually calculate it in perturbative TCD. And then another one that's intrinsic, and that one is a non perturbative effect, I can hope to calculate something about it on the lattice, but I'm not going to be able to use perturbative TCD. Yeah. So, actually, defined on top of this blackboard, it's a uh, it's not the longitudinal fraction that appears in the. Yeah, so I didn't, I was kind of right, but I didn't. So now that you asked it well, so it's actually the longitudinal fraction of the photons plus momentum relative to the large PA plus um, coming out of Likewise, now I have to think. So these are measures plus and minus components. And I understand that when you you have a Q and a Q bar hitting each other, that's a definition of drill yan. Is P A plus big and P minus big? Is that also a definition of drill yan? It, that's just happening because of the being in the center of mass frame, and it's made in the center of mass frame. Let's say for plus Q Z is positive, and it, and the fact that it, the overall and that it's traveling in this direction means that the on top of the Hadron mass is effectively almost zero, so the energy is basically the same as it would be These are just adding the fact that we're in that frame and we're in making a hard collision is what makes it big. Okay, so let me go and introduce now another process which is important uh, for the EIC. And that is what's called semi inclusive EIS. So this is like the DIS that George introduced, but in this case, we are a little less inclusive. And that's because we're gonna measure 
uh, one additional hadron in the final state with some formal NTP hadron. And then we allow still anything else. So the, the process George introduced to PIS was just this, okay, anything. Now we have a hadron here. You can think of it like a pion. It could be a rho meson, it could be something else, most of our pions. <laughs> and so let me draw a picture of that. We have our incoming proton. From it, there's a quark that gets struck by the virtual photon and it's exchanged by the electron. Electron scatters. Then this is Q. And then there's the struck quark going out. And instead of just going out into the X, we all, we all ask about the process of this thing fragmenting into a final state hadron, H. Of course, there's some other quarks that are inside this proton. And in order for this thing to be a hadron, say to be a pion, we'd have to pick up another antiquark somewhere. Pion is the quark antiquark, it's a meson. And so there's going to be some, some muon radiation. This quark's going to come from somewhere. Another quark. Stuff and everything that's not that hadron. All this other stuff. So this is a very useful process also for studying PMDs. In this process, Q squared is negative. So that's the opposite of the really end there. This is a T channel exchange, that's negative. And then George you can use George and X variable. There's two other variables that often get talked about, which since they'll eventually be important in the lecture, I'll have to use now. <laughs> called X and Z, Y and Z. So Y is like how much energy does the rest, it's easiest to think about them in the rest frame of the spot of one. And then we're picking out Q0 over L0. And Q0 is like how much energy was taken away by this virtual photon. So it's like the energy loss of the final state electron is what Y there is describing. And if in your, you're in that rest frame, then you have the hadron energy divided by Q0 of the photon. So it's how much energy does the hadron carry away relative to the energy that this photon injected into the system. Okay, so so far that doesn't have any transverse momentum. So let's introduce transverse momentum. To introduce transverse momentum, we had to sort of decide what the z-axis was. And over here, it was kind of very simple. We just said z-axis, center of mass frame, gravity. For CITES, it's a little more complicated. So I'm gonna actually describe it to you two different ways. The first way is just to make a very direct analog to the Lillian process. And this is what people call the hadron hadron frame. So, in this case, I again choose my frame since so the transverse momentum of the proton is zero, just like we had in Jordan. And then I have a final state hadron, and we can choose its transverse momentum to be zero too. The difference here is that this hadron's in the final state, this one's in the initial state. I can still choose a frame where they're back to back. It's kind of the analog of this one here, both your own hadron. And in this frame, we can think about how the momentum exchange works. Kind of staring again at the just at this vertex. Things are kind of simple. We have some KT here, we have some PT prime here, and just the four vector. Three, the two vector momentum conservation tells us that the PT is just the difference. Okay, so that, that's again sort of saying that if there's intrinsic, uh, if there's some transverse momentum that you measure with electrons in this frame, then uh, it's going to have to come from the difference of the 
transverse momentum of this quark that you pulled out of the proton and the transverse momentum of this quark that went on to fragment into a hadron with zero transverse momentum. So that's like this had transverse momentum. Where did it go? Defined in the frame that this pion has zero transverse momentum. And the place that it went is it went to the rest, right? So this we have each prime. So it goes from working to the rest of the stuff on the back hadron this frame. Now that frame is beloved by theorists, but not so much by experimentalists. Because you know, one of the harder things to do is measure the hadron and it's transverse effective. It's not something bold. And so experimentally, what's much better is to use a frame that's more related to the things you can measure well, not the electrons. And of course, you know what's going on with your incoming protons. So you want to use a different frame from that frame experimentally. So a kind of alternate to this frame is to use the photon instead of one of the nitrons. So we still keep the, the incoming proton at zero transverse momentum, but we boost and rotate and do a Lorentz transformation to a frame where the transverse momentum of the photon is zero. And in this frame, things work a little differently. Now we've lost, this guy will now have transverse momentum, and then that's what experimentally you would measure. Okay. <clears throat> and for, for time reasons, I won't go through all the details of that Lorentz transformation. Uh, I'm not sure I can do it in the remaining time on the board to get it right. But in that frame, the momentum conservation becomes the following. You have a non-zero hadron transverse momentum, and it's given by some PT and some KT term. And you can think of it like this from the picture. Nice. Here's your, your PhD. There's some boosted momentum for the incoming quark that turns out to be ZKT. And the rest of this stuff in this frame is PT. So the fact that ZKT is PhD plus minor PT, I'm just going on the other side. And that's usually the way that people write down the cross sections. Trying to make it more experimentally friendly. And these two formulas are expressed in the physics of transverse momentum conservation, just in different frames. So it's just a Lorentz transformation. So you do the PT prime then? Yeah, just because it's in a different frame. So the PT prime and the PT are related. I see. But they're in fact uh, PT prime is like the minus PT divided by ZH. Mm -hmm. So how does this measure transverse momentum? So it's, again, it's kind of like the story that we had with Galliand. But in this case, we have a final state object and an initial state object. And so instead of just having a, a part on distribution function proton, we have what's called a fragmentation. And so I'm Given that the letter D, which is the fragmentation function, and then there's a momentum conserving delta function, which usually are written in variables on this second frame. So this fragmentation function is the thing that would be probing the hadronization. How does this quark that's coming out of the hard vertex? Produce that hadron with a particular momentum, given that it has some initial starting transverse momentum. And you can see that this PT would be different in these two. KHT minus KHT. This is the fragmentation of the quark, which is K, what J. Hmm. Well, I guess everything I wrote have the same quark measures. So, I. <clears throat> so it's the fragmentation of that quark I into a particular hadron, which is the describing hadron H. And again, some momentum fraction 
has a longitudinal component. <laughs> and a transverse component. And that transverse component, PT, is the hadron momentum relative to the quark momentum. And so it's giving you a three-dimensional picture for the, for the fragmentation process of quark turning into a hadron. Okay, so that kind of introduces you to the ideas there's a lot of details that I skipped. I like to think of this a little bit like peeling an onion. When I think about transverse momentum distributions, I think about taking an onion and peeling it. And under the, the first layer of the onion is another layer, another layer. Because TMDs are kind of complicated objects. So I can't really describe to you everything about them at one go. So I'm going to be peeling layers of an onion. And if you wonder why I picked an onion, relative to some other object that has pairs. Uh, it's because it's also a little painful, so there may be some tears involved. <laughs> but I did find some So we're gonna dig in layer by layer into these two pieces. And some of the formulas you made, I noticed that I like to kind of wrote dots, right? So I actually haven't described everything I want us to take a step back before we, we get to TMD. I talk about, so I'm talking layers, layers of the onion, talking about layer one. <clears throat> and layer one will be introducing some of the concepts of factorization, which remembers what connects observables to uh, distribution functions, just those two degrees. But before I talk about TMDs, let me talk a little bit about hardware distribution functions in this class in George's lecture. But I need a particular, I need in particular to introduce you to one concept, which I'm not sure George will. So let me think about introducing overall transverse momentum, QT. And so then I'm going to get back to the I'm not measuring transverse momentum, I'll get rid of these transverse conditions. I'm making a measurement, say, Q squared of the process much bigger than that, which is A squared, so there's a scale separation. And I'm going to focus here, as I said, on Drell Yan, and that avoids some of these frame issues that it has in Citus case. And it's just a little simpler because it involves just two partner distributions, not one partner distribution or fragmentation. We'll do a lot of our calculations for Drell Yan and then extend them. And it was a DIS because things basically. Okay, so what is linear factorization? So, linear factorization, kind of in all its glory, is the following <laughs> there's a longitudinal distribution function. Now, I am being more explicit about all its indices. And as George was talking about the Quartron model, it can be described in kind of two parts, which I will describe here as scattering of those quarks in the Drellian process, and then some Quartron distribution functions that tell me the probability of finding a quark with a particular fraction of the Now, there's this additional variable mu, and that's it's called the factorization scale or the normalization scale. And I'll describe to you in a picture what it would have been. So in this picture, I've got these integrals. And they say that the external momentum, remember XA and XB were related to the photons kinematics. But the, those XA and XB are not, you know, just Cassi A and Cassi B. At lowest order in this thing, they are. So if there's no uh, gluon radiation in the problem, and CDA is just equal to XA, the CB is just equal to XB. And this goes behind the picture when we say that we're like, that the, this Bjork and X variable is the variable that this PDF is just directly measuring. That's, that's true at true level. 
And beyond tree level, you get these intervals where the C variables that are inside these partner distribution functions can be bigger than the XA and the XB. And I want to explain to you why that, that can happen. So CA can be greater than XA with the following, in the following situation. So it's really due to the fact that there's gluon radiation. And the fact that there's two scales in this problem. So let me do the following. Let me draw the process as follows. Let me have my U plus B minus pair, but I'll, I'll loop it up and draw what's called a forward scattering diagram. This is a way of drawing the amplitude. Remember, we're doing quantum mechanical, we're doing quantum mechanics here. So probabilities are amplitude squared. And one way of drawing an amplitude squared is to draw these kind of what are called cut diagrams. So you've got the amplitude on the left, then you've got the complex conjugate amplitude on the right. And then you, when you draw this picture, you sort of multiply them together. So this green line here is the final state. And then this is sort of in, in on the left bar line to the far right, the amplitude on the conjugate. Okay, but I want to use this type of picture to explain to you what's going on with gluon radiation. So if I had gluon radiation into the final state, I could have the following happen. <clears throat> I radiate some gluon. The same color, color as my photon. Oh. Well, that's uh, a process, but that can happen. But it can kind of happen at two different scales. It could be that this gluon has a very large energy. This would be at the scale Q. Or it could be that this gluon has a very small energy. Very small. <clears throat> And then it would be at the scale of these external particles. So I'll leave it white in the picture. It's still a gluon, but now it's at the scale of lambda. So the process actually divides itself up into two different things happening. One where the gluon has is has large energy and one where it has small energy. The one where it has small energy is actually part of the partner distribution function. And the one which has large energy is actually part of this object. Picture of this object is left on as well as this gluon. There's white ones here, white ones. <clears throat> now in this picture here, if we have some initial quark fraction to CA, when this splitting happens, we can go to, to have some different fraction that actually enters the hard interaction there. And we, from measuring the photon kinematics, we know that that's XA. So the final thing is XA, but the initial thing doesn't have to be equal to the final state thing because this gluon can take off something. It can take off this A minus XA. This way, watch it in direction. And that's why this guy, the CA, doesn't have to be uh, the same as XA here. And if, you, if this is a real gluon, it's going to say that CA minus XA should be positive, and that's what leads to CA being bigger than XA, just because this is some positive energy gluon that really goes into the final state. It's like the CA is greater than XA. Right. It's obvious, but what happens to the intermediate energy gluons? Are they just not there? So I've only drawn one gluon. I could draw more gluons, right? And there's many more gluons in general in the problem. But we're just in the simplest possible thing so, <clears throat> so far. Sorry. Uh, why did you put the, uh, it says here that this first diagram without more is equal to the sum of those two. Yeah, I'm, I'm not done yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 
So kind of ran out of room to kind of manage to remember that and write something about the diagrams to try to explain it. So why two diagrams? So the way that you should think about it is that this diagram has invariant masses that are above some cutoff, and this diagram has invariant masses that are below that cutoff. And so there was this renormalization scale, factorization scale, it kind of behaves like a cutoff that showed up in the problem. And it appears both in these part-time distribution functions, as well as this cross-section, short, what people call short distance cross-section or hard cross-section. So short distance means large momentum. And so you can think of it as like the invariant mass is above some value. And then rat physics, including those gluons, got stuck into this piece. But if for the small momentum gluons, the ones that are closer to time with QCD, those go into this piece. So in this process with this one gluon level, it's kind of like taking that formula and expanding it out with one gluon. In this picture here, it's like you have the sigma at, okay, at one loop layer. And then these part time distribution functions, you just have a tree level. So the one gluon went into the horn, into the magenta thing. And over here, you've got the tree level cross section cell, and you took one gluon inside the F. <laughs> so that's why there's two diagrams. I have, could have a one loop correction here or a one loop correction here. And the full diagram right here, which is a full gluon that has no restrictions on its momentum scale, uh, is split into two parts. And that happens because of the expansion of Q being much bigger than mine. Hmm. Do I understand correctly the statement here that uh, if you want to expand all this uh, in powers of alpha s, then the leading terms are these diagrams with this very kinematics with, with this particular range of momenta. And if we expand further, then maybe we'll find terms with other range of momenta. Yeah, in this particular diagram, because C has this interpretation, but like this formula is completely general, includes any number of plots. It's just that my, my example is one. Or even if there's more radiation, it still fits into this formula. You can think of it to see like the total. Yeah. But that one gluon is only allowed to have one of two. There's a whole region of momentum. Yeah, it's basically. So I divided it, split. Like I think about p squared as a line, right? Yeah. It has any values. And I just put one cut off. And I said the, the, the part time distribution functions are down here and the short distance cross section. Thank you. Okay, so there's something else that you should ask though, and that is why are there two PDFs? Because I could have in this process, I could have a blue line go like this between I and J. And if that happens, it would be a gluon that's exchanged between this and this, and they wouldn't be incoherent if a gluon like that was allowed. But something has to be happening to forbid that. And so what's actually happening? Why two PDFs? Why two decoupled PDFs? <laughs> What's actually happening is the following. And let me again still use the same pictures. So when we take this picture and we ask, what does this gluon look like? Uh, well, if this gluon is sort of a gluon that was moving along inside the proton I, then it, when it talks to J, there's going to be something that happens. And that's because it doesn't, the kinematics actually cause it to not really see the full structure of J. It only like sees the overall color structure of J, a certain color charge. 
but it doesn't see the inter in internal dynamics of that core. And so what happens is the following. That the quark I, when it look when the gluons in the quark I look at J, they see what's called a Wilson quark. And when the gluons in quark J, near quark J, look at quark I, they also see a Wilson quark. So there's a decoupling because this article here is seen by this gluon as if it's a Wilson quark. And a Wilson line is a much, much simpler object than a dynamical vault bag of quarks and lines. It's just a very simple object. <clears throat> so that happens on the left. In the left, in the right, this, this, these ones think they're attaching to a Wilson line. These ones, the Joe type, they're attaching to a Wilson line. <clears throat> and it's not a special equation, so let me not write that. I want to write one loop graph equals two loop graph. <laughs> and the same thing happens on the other sides. <clears throat> and so then if I group the I parts together from the two sides, that gives me a part time distribution function. So these two sides are going to be F I of P. And then if I take the other two, which is green, it's giving me F J. That's how, that's why there's a factorization between these two, um, between these two, and the one like that is not spoiling this incoherence, having these two separate part time distribution functions. Now, in the end of the day, what that leads to is it leads to kind of a short distance physics, which I've been noted here by this bubble. And then if I take these parts and really group them together, if I take the I parts and group them together, and I take the J parts and group them together. And they're, they're just attached together by a Wilson line. And you may remember in George's lectures that there were quark fields at two different points. Quark field here and quark field there. They're attached together by a Wilson, this Wilson line to make an overall gauge of your object. But the physics of the Wilson line was like, it, it was how the other quark looked to the gluons that were friendly with this quark. That's what I'm traveling along, sometimes called collinear. Now I realized that this last little bit has been a little bit fast. And so I've, in my notes, posted an exercise for you to actually understand this. Okay, so there's another page of my notes, which I'm not gonna go through. But in that exercise, if you go through that exercise, you will actually literally do this, this type of calculation. Um, explaining this exercise. Exercise. And so the exercise is, is exactly set up just a tree level Feynman diagram of quark quark annihilation. And we're going to, I tell you in the notes how to set up the expansion. And I, I tell you to take a gluon and attach it to I, where K and, and PJ have sort of the same scaling on momentum and different scaling gluons. Okay, like a J by gluon, because the more formal momentum scales the same as the formal momentum of this PJ. So basically it's you know, something with a lot of energy traveling in this direction and maybe some small fluctuations relative to that direction. That's what K is. And the PI is the other way, large momentum coming this way, small fluctuations. Okay, so in the, in the lecture, you'll see this exercise spelled out, and you'll see that if you expand this Feynman diagram, then this propagator here induces the propagator of the Wilson line. So it's like this gluon is not attaching to that full quark, but to the Wilson line. 
this back was actually, even though I'm drawing it for this simple diagram, true for any number of supplies. I can have all sorts of radiation inside here. I can attach more gluons. And this idea that there's a single Wilson line remains true, even if I add more gluons. Yeah. Well, this is a line or a fundamental design, or does it depend on? Yeah, here it's a fundamental because it's attaching to a quark. And in general, it will be in the representation of this object, of the, the object here, it's sim2. So if I was attaching a quark and a gluon, scattering a quark and a gluon, a quark and a quark, then I would get, for this guy, get, I would get a fundamental most line in his direction, and the gluon, I would get an adjoint most line in his direction. But here, they're just both fundamentals. But because there's going to be, Brings up the fact that there's going to be the opposite. It's going to be k's that are sim to pi. And if I attach them in the opposite way, I also get a Wilson line. And that's why there's like this Wilson line and that Wilson line. Two Wilson lines here. Both of them will be fundamental in this case. I, that, I, so that's so interesting. What about the final state, like the representations? You exchange a good one, you can either just stay in the fundamental reps or yeah. you could transform into an anti fundamental. Does the Wilson line picture still work? It still works. The Wilson line is are fundamental and anti fundamental are just related by conjugations. So those ones aren't so complicated and oh. they're just following the representations of the particles that they are attaching to yeah. in order to make sure, sure that all the indices work out in the right way. So here you sort of have quark and a quark, and you think of this as a fundamental line. If you're thinking of this as an anti-quark, you can think of it as an anti-fundamental traveling forward, not just the same uh, fundamental traveling backwards. So there's relations like that. The representations, the color representations, are just exactly sort of what, it, what is needed to make the object the agent variable. Okay, so let me actually write down formula for a Wilson line. This object, some path gamma, is defined as a Wilson line. And what is it? It's a path-ordered exponential. Path-ordered because this is SU3, QCD. That means that there's some color matrices and we have to decide in what order to multiply them. That's what path-ordering has to do, it has to correspond to. Well, this just means multiply color matrices along the path. In the same order as the path. Expand this thing out. And then this gluon just gets integrated along the path, which sort of means you can pictures you can attach a gluon at this position or later at this position. There's some color representation. Oh, that's the definition. And it has very nice properties under gauge transformation. It just transforms on the ends, not along the path, as we did here. It just transforms and says you're going to X. And that's what cancels out the gauge transformations of the quarks as a zero and X. This place is here. Okay, so I think I've gone a little bit over. Stop there, then we'll come back and talk about P of D's. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for comments, Suyin? My, I'm a little confused. Can I ask? My understanding of factorization was that the soft approximation. So, is that when when QT exchanged is very, when the transverse momentum exchange between I and J is very large, then uh, the soft approximation breaks down and. And that only comes back if you don't measure QT, yeah. is, was my understanding. Yeah, but yeah, now yeah. you're saying measure QT. Well, that next time, actually. You're, you're exactly seeing kind of something that I will talk about at the beginning of next lecture. Okay. Yeah. So, like so far, I'm doing it only for the case of integrated over all transverse momentum. So, I avoided talking about it. Okay. And when I reintroduce a differential in transverse momentum, I think I will directly address what you're asking. We'll do that at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture. Um, 
but happy to talk to you about it afterwards if you want to, if you can't wait. <laughs> Are there experimental observables? Like, could you distinguish whether you started out with this Wilson line picture, whether you started out with a true QCD dye quark, an anti fundamental rep versus just two quarks exchanging a gluon? Um, Not really that question, but kind of uh, a related question we will deal with. And that is uh, associated to the fact that the, whether these Wilson lines are incoming or outgoing, that is something that we can experimentally access. We'll get there. Okay. But the fact that they're they're funded, that they're in this particular color representation and that they separate, it's really just coming from the kinematics. Kinematics is what's driving expanding this propagator out and then coming looking like a Wilson line. And then the the fact that it has to be in a particular representation in order for color to work out is what drives it into the fundamental representation. So you don't have a lot of freedom. Anything else? All right, that's the join for the break then. So we have called enough. Let's go ahead and break till quarter of, and at quarter of, uh, we'll start the um, start the tutorials then. So have a nice coffee break. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I think I'm coming. Yeah. Actually, on the time is like Actually, I saw. Actually, yeah. Two two hours. We're gonna burn. First of all, um, uh, I think the uh, center and axis was okay if we I use was, it. You know, it's, way, it's, they said that they um, they said that we talked to you actually, actually. Uh, and this problem. Problem. their concern is that I would uh, about having us pay for rate expense on this. Does that make sense? Okay.